Well, praise the Lord. It is good to be back in the house of the Lord and see God's saints gathering together to worship Him and to hear the word of the Lord. And uh, I know it's going to be a good day, precious Savior. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different. And uh, we're going to be speaking about the prophets. And this is an issue that... that uh, I'd love to see behind us, but it'll be a long time before the, uh, the thing with the prophets of America is behind us, behind the church. And really the shame that's been brought up on the church because of those that prophesied falsely uh, concerning this past election. But I'm going to read several things, and first I'm going to... Uh, refer to the uh, January issue of Charisma Magazine. We have, as most of you know, we have three pages, full pages, in Charisma Magazine every month. And uh, one page is Pastor Keith's page. It's a, the uh, Simply Christ. It's a wonderful ministry that's, that's just growing so fast around the world. It's Simply Christ. And we have two pages that, that I write, which are, Behold the Lamb, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And uh, we've been in charisma. Uh, we, we had our first full-page message in, in 2015, right after the courts uh, ruled gay marriage to be legal. And I wrote the message, How We Lost America, because that was evidence at that point that we'd already lost this nation. And when, with the election of Donald Trump, I wrote the message, Intervention, that, that it was an intervention, but it was a time for the church to, to actually repent, turn to the Lord, and preach the truth of the gospel that makes people free from sin. But that didn't happen. That didn't happen. And now then, America is going to suffer uh, for a time, the judgment of God. I hope it's a short time. I really hope it's a short time. But I can assure you that America is suffering the judgment of God. You say, well, what are you talking about, Brother Surface? Something the Lord told me many years ago. This is a time that in 1972 that my house burnt to the ground, totally, loss of everything. Had six children and we had no place to live. We moved first into a, a 35-foot uh, uh, travel trailer, with eight by 35-foot travel trailer for a time in one of the worst winters. Had three snows in Houston, Texas that year, and, and we lived it you know, in mobile homes and travel trailers and such uh, because her house was burnt and I was weeping before God and the Lord made it clear to me that nothing can come into our life except God permits it. Nothing, absolutely nothing can come into our life except God permits it if you're a child of God or if you're not a child of God. Nothing can come into your life except God permits it. That's the way that we know that God is in charge. He's in control. Praise God. And if things are going wrong, if I'm being chastened, I learn to rejoice because it says, every son whom he loveth, he chasteneth. And when I was chastened over the years, I'd say, well, thank you, Lord, that you love me. Thank you, Lord, and you receive the chastening of the Lord gladly because he loves you. But what has come upon this nation, God has permitted to come upon this nation. And I'll tell you what has come upon this nation. And in the first new day, two days of the new administration, there are five sins, five sins that I've preached on repeatedly and wrote about repeatedly over the 20 year, past 20 years. I know ever since 9-11, 2001, and I believe back in the 90s, I was warning about the five sins in Revelations, the fifth chapter. And those five sins, just commonly in our everyday language, are, 
or idolatry, the worship of other gods, and murders or abortion, and our drug culture, and the, the, the fornications, the perversion and immorality it's in America, and finally the thefts. And in the first two days of the new administration, uh, they strengthened, they strengthened the sins that God judges. And for example, idolatry, uh, they gave by, by presidential decree that, uh, that the ban on immigration from radical Muslim nations would be lifted. There'd been a ban for four years now on immigration from the radical, not from Muslim nations, but from the radical Muslim nations where the terrorists were formed. That ban has been lifted so that uh, more worshipers of other, other gods can come in, those that believe it's, it, it's their God's will to destroy and kill Christians and Jews. Well, that ban has been lifted. Number two, uh, the murders, the abortions. There's a presidential decree given, and I don't understand this. I don't know if it'll stand, but it said that it codified uh, abortion, Roe versus Wade, into law. I don't, I don't know that the president has the authority to do that, but by presidential decree, he did that. He strengthened the abortion law. That's the second of the five sins that God judges the nations for. The third one is sorceries. And of course, you can know it was already going to be the case, I suppose, that, that, that the drug laws will be changed. And of course, marijuana will be made legal in every state. And, uh, and, and even the hard drug laws will, will cease to be enforced and so on. But yet, that, that's not yet by presidential decree. The next one, after the sorceries, the, the drugs, is fornication. And yes, that's been strengthened because the decree was given that in the high schools and the, the junior highs and the colleges, I suppose, that, uh, that, that, that boys that were born males, boys that claim to be girls can compete with the girls in, in the athletics and use their dressing rooms and, uh, and bathrooms. You know, that, that there'd be no, no difference between boys and girls in the use of the restrooms, and especially in sports. I don't know if that's uh, uh, across the board or not. I don't know. But he strengthened the, 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 uh, for, the uh, pornography, the fornications, the perversions. He strengthened their hand. And then I thought, well, the only one that he didn't touch was the thefts. And then I realized it may be that we've seen the greatest theft in the history of the nation, if not the world, in the past two months it may, or six months. It may be. I'm not, I'm not going to go that far as to say that, but it may be. And they will never repent of that theft if, in fact, they did steal the uh, presidency of the United States. And I'm not saying they did. I, I give that much uh, uh, allowance, but I personally believe that they did. Nevertheless, my opinions beside, I want to go back to the January issue of Charisma. My message was when God cleanses his church. And it started out, talking about the cleansing by the blood of Jesus and sanctified by the will of God. A couple of paragraphs about that. That Christ shed his blood to wash the people from their sins. That's sinners and ungodly. That's everybody that will believe and call upon him. He will wash them from their sins in the blood of Jesus. But when you end up with a church age that believes that we're all sinners and will always be sinners as long as we live in this body, uh, then the church has not been cleansed by the blood of Jesus because they've ceased to preach the blood of Jesus as a cleansing from sin. They begin to preach as a covering for sin, which it is not. The blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. He's the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And so uh, I wrote about a paragraph on God's greatest vengeance. 
Those that trod the Son of God underfoot count the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified be an unholy thing and do despite under the Spirit of grace. That's where God takes his greatest vengeance according to the scriptures in the 10th chapter of Hebrews. And then a paragraph on the spirit of judgment and burning. And this is way back in, uh, in, in Isaiah. I believe it's, uh, it, 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 well, this was in Isaiah, the fourth chapter. And uh, it talks about that God will take away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purge the blood of Jerusalem by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. And when the people will not be cleansed by the blood of Jesus, God will purge them out of his church by judgment, by the spirit of judgment and burning. And he said in Isaiah 4, he shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion, he that remaineth in Jerusalem, shall be called holy. Praise God. The next uh, section I wrote was the righteous judgment of God. And I'm going to read that to you. That's how that the, the January issue of Charisma, Behold the Lamb, wrote, The righteous judgment of God. Scripture, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. If it first begin at us, what shall be the end of those that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where should the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him and do it well doing as unto a faithful creator. 1 Peter 4, 17 and 19. When God sent the destroying angels to destroy Jerusalem, he commanded them, slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And that was the name of God written in their forehead. Don't come any near any and on whom is more and begin at my sanctuary. That's judgment beginning at the house of God. That's Ezekiel 9 and 6. The first ones to be slaughtered were the 70 elders of Israel. Their destruction was not because they were holy men of God, but because they worshipped other gods in the chambers of their imagery, Ezekiel 8 and 12, which according to the Hebrew word refers to their imaginations. They worshiped a wrong image of God which they held in their hearts. My heart was as heavy as I write this message. Hatred has divided our nation. Hatred has set fire to numerous cities, destroyed and looted many businesses and murdered our policemen. With all this happening in our nation, some are prophesying God's judgment against America. The truth of this matter is these things are God's judgment against America, which has come upon us because of the American church. It is in the church that the glory of the incorruptible God has been changed into a corruptible image. Romans 1, 23 and 24. It is in the church that the truth of God has been changed for a lie, Romans 1, 25 and 26, when God's judgment comes to America, it must begin at the house of God. In January 1986, I received a vision of three years of God's judgment against the church in America, which was fulfilled in the years 1987 through 1989. According to the vision, judgment would begin with television ministries. In April 1987, the largest television ministry in the world fell due to sex and money scandal. Ten months later, in February 1988, the remaining largest TV ministry fell to a sex scandal. In that same year, in the same denomination as both of these ministers, 285 pastors of Lord's churches also fell through scandals. What a horrible time it was for the church, but what an opportunity at the same time for the church to repent and turn. Sadly, it did not. Instead, when several famous preachers of the day were chosen to represent the church, were interviewed by Ted Koppel on his nightline broadcast, 
Their only defense was, we are all sinners, we sin every day. Only D. James Kennedy, the pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Florida, gave a righteous response to Ted Koppel's questioning. All the others on the panel also denied the right of the world to judge the church. This was a seed planted which has contributed to the generation of the modern church. Scripture, my heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake like a drunken man, like a man whom wine is overcome because of the Lord, because of the words of his holiness. Jeremiah 23 at 9. A generation ago, the judgment of the church began with the evangelists and pastors. God is even now beginning to judge the church again. This time, His judgment will begin with the many prophets who have learned how to prophesy during this generation. The veil of secrecy which has covered them will be pulled back and many, perhaps millions, who have been under their spell will go free. Even the most staunch supporters will find it necessary to either separate from them or perish with them. It will seem like a hard time for the church to endure. But when it is finished, the righteous shall shine forth as the sun, and the last day harvest will begin. Now this was my message in Charisma in January. But the messages that are in Charisma have to be uh, written almost two months before they're published. That's the timeline. So this message was written right after the November election, around the 8th, the 10th, the 12th of November was when this message was written. And uh, and it ends up with with the coming judgment of God, beginning at the house of God, beginning with the prophets uh, of the church, the company of prophets. And I, I know that that has begun at this time. I wrote another message uh, Charisma does not have a February issue. They've combined the January and the February. So I wrote another message that would not come out to March, and Charisma chose not to publish it. Uh, they chose not to. They feared that it would be too divisive and, and such. And, uh, and I, I can't understand that, that in that what I submitted would not be published until March. They're hoping that it will pass over by that time. So I don't totally, you know, blame Charisma for their decision, but I'm disappointed, very disappointed in their decision. But Charisma did publish this in their their electronic their the E E magazine from Michael Brown, Dr. Michael Brown. Dr. Michael Brown is a Jewish believer and it's very large in the charismatic movement and also in the uh, Messianic uh, uh, church movement and so on, and probably a good man. I, I don't know much about him. I, I thought that this was the Michael Brown that was, was the uh, uh, theologian at the uh, Pensacola revival in the 90s. I don't know if there's any connection there or not for sure. But I'm going to read what Michael Brown wrote to the prophets in America, and it's worth listening to. It's very straight. It's very good. January 20th is past, and Joe Biden, not Donald Trump, is the president of the United States. To all those who prophesied that Trump would serve a second consecutive term and assured us that he would be inaugurated on January 20th, I appeal to you in the strongest possible terms. Admit your error, take full responsibility, and do not under any circumstances continue put a false hope in the hearts of God's people. What you prophesied did not come to pass. There's not an alternative spiritual reality in which, still is still tr- tr- fun- in which Trump is still functioning as president. Nothing is going to change in a month or year. It's over. It's over. I said that a number of weeks ago. It's over. Even if there was massive electoral fraud. The results of this election will not be overturned. Donald Trump will not serve a second consecutive term. Face the facts. Be accountable before God and man. 
Take the hits that will be coming and humble yourself before the Lord and his people. This is not a time for excuses. This is not the time to concoct spiritual myths. This is absolutely not the time to blame others. If you prophesied falsely, you and you alone are to blame. Maybe you were acting in sincerity and integrity, truly believing the Lord had spoken and doing your best to stand firm in faith no matter what. After all, you thought, isn't that what faith does? Maybe you were so grieved over where the radical left is going that you prophesied what you desired, namely the re-election of Trump. Maybe you sensed God's intent, namely that if Trump would repent of his pride and the church would repent of looking to him in an idolatrous way, God would give him four more years. Maybe you got caught up in the power of the group, finding affirmation in others saying the same things. Maybe you prophesied what your people wanted to hear, subconsciously tickling their itching ears. Maybe you got caught up in a partisan political spirit. Maybe you looked to Trump as a political messiah and God answered you out of the idolatry of your own heart. Or maybe you fell prey to demonic deception. Whatever the cause, you prophesied falsely. Now this is John, uh, I mean Michael Brown speaking to the prophets of America and published by Charisma Magazine. So I honor Charisma Magazine for publishing this even though they did not want to publish our March issue. Nevertheless, as a result of your false prophecies, many believers are experiencing a crisis of faith right now. Who will be there to pick pick up the pieces? After all, they wonder, how could all the prophets be wrong to the extent that you exert your hearers to hold on to the very end, to the extent that you are responsible to bringing them to this point of crisis. Worse still, some of you issued prophetic threats to those who questioned your words, telling them they had to believe the prophets or else. And you did this while claiming to speak directly for God. The Lord does not take it lightly when His people are abused like this. He will hold you responsible for misrepresenting Him. Absolutely true. So many of God's people are hurting and the world is mocking us, thinking that our faith in Jesus is just as false as these failed Trump prophecies. One man, young man posted online that he'd been telling his family members, none of whom were believers, that Trump would be reelected based on the words of the prophets. He thought it would glorify the Lord when Trump was miraculously inaugurated. Now he said, He doesn't think he can ever talk to them about the Lord again. Do you realize the damage that has been done? One woman who falsely claims to be a prophet said that God is making a list noting who is listening to the prophets and who is not. Those are not, she warns, claiming to speak for the Lord will lose their voice and their ministries. This deep deception and spiritual Serious spiritual, this is deep deception and serious spiritual manipulation. If God is making a list, it is a list of those who misled his sheep, a list of those who threatened his children if they failed to believe the prophets, a list of those who brought dishonor to the name of his son. Now is a time to repent openly, publicly, and forthrightly. Now is the time to found accountability from other leaders in the body who did not fall into the same error. Now is the time for some serious soul searching. It's what the Bible calls bringing forth fruits worthy of repentance, Matthew 3 and 8. This is no small thing. If you continue to prophesy falsehoods and assure your followers that Biden will soon be replaced by Trump, and I don't mean in 2024, I warn you that you're moving into complete spiritual fantasy and leading others with you. Careful. The reality that I'm writing is that I'm writing all this as a charismatic leader rather than a charismatic basher. 
as a proponent of prophetic ministry rather than, than an unponent, opponent. I'm writing as a friend, not as an enemy. In fact, it is holy jealousy that drives me, jealousy for the honor of Jesus' name, jealousy for the health of his flock, and jealousy for the purity of prophetic ministry. I also write out of holy jealousy for your own ministry and calling. All of us can make mistakes, even serious ones like this. Our God is the God of forgiveness and redemption is the central message of our faith. You can come out of this closer to Jesus, deeper in the word, godlier in character, and more in tune to the Spirit. In the depth of your humility to that degree, the Lord will restore and rebuild. But please, I appeal to you again, don't blame others, don't make excuses, and don't perpetuate any further spiritual fantasy. It's over. Now, what are you going to do? That was Michael Brown's message to the prophets of America. There's one difference between Michael Brown's message that Charisma published and the message that I submitted that they chose not to publish. Michael Brown condemned what the prophets did. My message condemned what they are. It's not that they were prophets of God who made a mistake. It's impossible for a prophet of God to make that mistake. It's impossible. A prophet of God speaks only what he hears from God and only what he sees from God. And these spoke of their own heart. They spoke visions of their own heart. They spoke from their own imaginations. They thought they heard from God. They'd been deceived by charismatic leaders who taught them that they could learn how to prophesy just like they learned how to speak in tongues. That is a grievous error that began in the church 50 years ago. And now they were eating the bitter fruit of a lie that was began to be taught 50 years ago that you could learn how to speak in tongues. You could learn how to prophesy and operate all the gifts of the Spirit. And we're eating that bitter fruit right now. And so, uh, you know, with, with uh, Michael Brown's message, which I honor, is very bold and straightforward, yet he leaves room that God is forgiving. He'll forgive you and you can continue. But, but that is not God's way with false prophecies and false prophets. Sunday, was it last Sunday? I gave just the scriptures concerning the, the, the prophets from the Old Testament. And the whole service was about the scriptures, you know, that prof tell about the prophets. Pastor Keith took those scriptures and, and pub printed an, an article, What Does God Say About Prophets? that he's going to send to all 36,000 on her mailing list by, by e email, not by paper mail, but by email. He's going to send it to all 36,000 on her mailing list. What does God say about prophets is the title of it. Does, how does God call a prophet? He said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently not in dark speeches. I've had over 50 years since 1966 of visions and dreams and dark speeches from God. And I dare not explain the dark speeches. You know, and say, God said this. God said, if Man have a dream, let him tell a dream. And so I've learned to say, I had a dream. And this is what I dreamed. Praise God. And I'm not responsible for that point on because I, had, I did not say God said. I had a dream once that I had a flying cat that flew me all over the nation wherever I wanted to go. 
You know, I didn't think that was a dream from God. You know, it's humorous. It's funny. I told it in my revivals everywhere. But I didn't think that was a dream from God. You know, so you tell a dream, praise God, and, and as a dream, <laughs> praise God. Okay, how do we know if a prophet is of God or merely, merely a presumptuous prophet? But if the prophet, Scripture, if the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. He presumes, he's a presumptions prophet, but under the law of Moses, that prophet shall die. And thou, if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, come, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him, and under the law of Moses that prophet shall die, because he spoke in the name of the Lord, and it did not come to pass. I'm talking about under the law of Moses. The scripture text is Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22. And I'll give them to them first, yes, in the future. Do signs or wonders prove that someone is a prophet of God? They give a sign or a wonder, and it comes to pass. Does that prove they're a prophet of God? That's Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. Is there, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass. Wherever he spake of thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known. Let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken to the words of that prophet, nor that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Next question. What are the signs of a presumptuous prophet. And the first one is in Jeremiah 23 and 16. Thus saith the Lord God, hearken not to the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart, not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, ye shall have peace. And they say to everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. That's Jeremiah 23, 16 and 17. The next scripture is Ezekiel 13, 6 through 8. They've seen vanity and lying divination. That's signs of a presumptuous prophet. Saying, the Lord saith, the Lord has not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have you not seen a vain vision? Have you not spoken a lie and divination? Whereas you say, the Lord saith it, behold, I have not spoken. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have spoken vanity and seen lies. Therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. Next question. Where does a presumptuous prophet get their prophecy? The first scripture is Ezekiel 13, 1 through 12. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe! to the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. The second scripture is Jeremiah 23, 30 through 32. Therefore, but I am be against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. I'm against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, he saith. I'm against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them. 
and caused my people to err by their lies and their lightness, yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Next question. Will God entrap a presumptuous prophet? Will God lay a trap for a presumptuous prophet? My, my, who would think such a thing? The scriptures in Ezekiel 14 and 9. If the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. That was Ezekiel 14 and 9. Next question. What judgment awaits a presumptuous prophet? The first scripture is Ezekiel 34, 9 and 10. I will stretch forth out my hand upon him, will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. They shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. The next scripture is Zechariah. 13, 2 and 3. What judgment awaits the presumptuous prophet? It shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. It shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, that his father and his mother that begat them shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. His father and mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. I'm not advocating that. Okay. That's Zechariah 13, 2 and 3. Next question. Can a presumptuous prophet repent? How can a presumptuous, presumptuous prophet repent? How can they repent? Scripture is Zechariah 13, 1 through 5. It shall come to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed every one of his vision when he hath prophesied. Neither shall he wear a rough garment to deceive, but he shall say, I am no prophet. I am an husbandman. For man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. They repent when they're ashamed of their vision and say, I'm not a prophet. I'm not a prophet. It's not that they say, God, I'm sorry, and go forward, you know, comforting sinners, speaking blessings upon that despise, those that despise God and all the signs of a false prophet that are fulfilled continuously, but they are ashamed of their prophecy and they say, I am not a prophet. I'm, I herd cattle. I, I make hay. I build buildings. I, but I'm not a prophet. Oh, my. I want to speak just a little bit. We have about 15 minutes left this morning about, about the, 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 the prophet. And I've already spoken from the scriptures and other writings about the prophet. But just for a second, in Ezekiel, and I have not marked this in Ezekiel. Ah, uh, Ezekiel, Ephesians, forgive me. I've been in the Old Testament too long this morning. And uh, in the 11th verse, he gave some. That's uh, Ephes Ephesians 4 and 11. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And uh, for the perfecting the saints, the work of the ministry, the edifying of the church, and so on. Some apostles and some prophets. Now we know that there were originally 12 apostles. Uh, Paul was an apostle of one born out of due season. I do believe that there are other apostles of Scripture names, numerous, that were apostles after the twelve. And I do believe that. And of the prophets in that early church, we know of Agabus, the, the prophet. He, he prophesied that he, he wrapped himself up in a girdle that belonged to Paul 
I think that's the belt. But he said, uh, he bound himself in it and said, the man that wears this shall be bound in chains and bonds when he comes to Jerusalem. And he was a prophet. He didn't tell Paul not to go to Jerusalem, but he said, whoever wears this belt will be bound in chains when he goes to Jerusalem. Paul said, none of this moves me. I don't count my life dear to me that I might finish my course with joy. And he went to Jerusalem. And Agabus' prophecy was fulfilled exactly. Agabus also prophesied a drought that was coming to the land of Judea. And it came, the scripture tells us, the very years that it came. Such a terrible drought that the churches from throughout Asia were, were raising uh, money and food to send to, to the churches in Judea. He was a prophet. Other than Agabus, I, I know that, that John, the apostle, was also a prophet. He, he wrote the revelation, his prophecy, the revelation, and, and one of the greatest prophecies of all time that's right on schedule 2,000 years later. It's right on schedule. It's not waiting for the last seven years, but it started immediately. After that first, before that first century ended, false teachers and false prophets began to come into the church. But as far as apostles and prophets, you can count the number of apostles on two hands, that first century church, and, and, and maybe the number on, of apostles, prophets, that we know about for certain on two fingers. <laughs> but they're undoubtedly, there were more than that. Now the scripture says that in Antioch when Saul of Tarsus went up there to teach that there were prophets there. But these were likely not prophets as in the second ministry of the church. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But probably prophets on the order of the gift of prophecy. You see, there's a difference between the ministry of a prophet and a gift of prophecy. And to confuse the two is really what has brought such a terrible, terrible day. People thinking they're prophets when they're not prophets. And uh, I, I don't believe they even had a gift of prophecy. Because for 50 years now, longer than most of them have been alive, They've been taught that you could learn how to do it. And you cannot learn how to do that which is the Holy Ghost is given to do. Nevertheless, coming over to, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to, to 1 Corinthians, and I'm going over to the, uh, the 12th chapter, and it gives, it, it gives the... Uh, it gives the gifts of the Spirit, and it says uh, in 1 Corinthians 12 and 10, to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, discerning of spirits, to another, to diverse kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh at one and self same Spirit. Prophecy is work by the Holy Ghost. If it's not wrought, the gift of prophecy, if it's not wrought by the Holy Ghost, then it's not a gift of prophecy. It's something you learned how to do. Let's go on. Let's see what this gift of prophecy is about. In the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, first verse, follow after charity, desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth, this is not a prophet. This is a gift of prophecy. He that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. That's the ministry of a gift of prophecy to edify, 
to exhort and to comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. And, uh, but don't you remember that? The gift of prophecy is not to foretell. The gift of prophecy is not to tell who's going to be the next governor, who's the next president, or any of these things. The gift of prophecy is for the church, and the gift of prophecy for edification, exhortation, and comfort. And a gift of prophecy has developed a form over most of my lifetime, frankly, that those with the gift of prophecy uh, usually start out earlier years in the Yea, thus saith the Lord. And they've used their tongues to say, God saith. And if God hadn't said, they're in trouble. If God doesn't say, they're in trouble. But there is a gift of prophecy for that the Spirit is speaking through the prophet. But in this gift of prophecy, there's also that which is, according to the, the Greek language is used, anointed speaking. Anointed speaking. Uh, the, you know, that, that the Scripture tells about, and I, I didn't mark this, whether it's in the 12th chapter or the 14th, I think it's in the 14th, how is it when you come together, uh, the 26th verse of 1 Corinthians 14, how is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, every one of you hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, that all things be done unto edifying. Okay. Now then, uh, when you come together, now these, every one of these would fall, I believe, in the category of the gift of prophecy, anointed speaking. You know, we used to have testimony services, and they were like popcorn. People were full of the Holy Ghost. And I'm talking about the church as it was in my youth and young days as pastor. People would jump up to testify one right after another, praise God, giving what God had spoken to them through the week, or, or, but it was all for edification, comfort, and, and, and exhortation. They weren't foretelling, you know, political events. They weren't dealing with such things, but they were all allowed to do it. Let the prophets prophesy one by one, let the other judge. And they're using the excuse today that, that you know, that a false prophecy doesn't make the prophet a false prophet. Yes, it does. They said if it made him a false prophet, then it wouldn't be judged by others. But see, that is the, the anointed speaking. That is the, you know, uh, uh, those that, that stand in the church body to exhort, edify, and comfort. You know, they speak one by one, others judge. If something's revealed to another, they stand. Praise God. And, and there would be a time given for this. It used to be our testimony service. They called it. But as the church lost the Holy Ghost, it devolved it into praise for the devil session. So we quit having them. Praise God. When you're full of the Holy Ghost and you jump up like popcorn with something to edify and glorify the Lord, edify the church, praise God. We'll love to have it again. Love to hear from you. Praise God. Okay. But, but he, he said, he said, he that prophesieth, prophesieth to uh, the edification. I want to go back to the uh, 12th chapter again. And uh, I'm sorry, the 14th chapter. Again, the earlier part. It says, sixth verse. If I come to you speaking with tongues, how shall I profit you except I speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying? See, those three, right there, revelation, knowledge, or prophesying, are mentioned together. You know, not by tongues, but by revelation, uh, uh, knowledge, or prophesying, or, or by doctrine. For even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet 
gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? And he's talking about speaking in tongues or prophesying. You know, the next verse. For likewise, except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall be known what is spoken for you speak in the air? So if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? But what if the prophets speaking in clear language give an uncertain sound? In fact, what if they deceive the people? What if they tell the people something's going to happen and it does not happen? What can be more uncertain than that? God's not the author of confusion. And these prophets that have done so were not prophets of God that made a mistake. They were not prophets of God. It's not what they did was horrible. It brought confusion to the church and, and, and shame to the church, ridicule to the church, which the church will suffer for a long time. Listen to me. They brought that upon the church, but it's not what they did, but what was more horrible than what they did is what they are. If they continue in any capacity to stand before the people as to speak the word of God, it must not be. Those that have prophesied falsely get away from them. If they'll denounce, be ashamed and denounce that they're a prophet, I'm not a prophet, I'm a goat herder, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a ditch digger, I'm a whatever, you know, praise God. They can, they can have salvation. If they have godly sorrow, it'll never turn loose of them. They can have salvation. Praise God. But they'll never again stand to speak in the name of the Lord. Never again. Praise God. There's so much more that's in me that I want to say to you. But it's time for our next service, so Let's find a place to pray for the next several minutes here in the congregation as we prepare for the next service. And God bless you. God bless you. Praise God.